as the dawning of the day moves us from darkness to light, so will the entrance of God's Word lighten up your life. Stay tuned for the teaching ministry of Charlotte Faber as she presents this light with Bringing to Light Ministries. Today is a, your day for victory in Jesus. Good day to you. I'm Charlotte Fowler, and it's a joy for me to be with you. We're going to get in our series in a few moments called Because He Lives, and I believe it'll be a real blessing to you. I know many of you have been so kind to write in and let us know that you found our program and what it means to you. What an encouragement. Thank you to you that have made a decision to pray for us and to stand with us financially. I want you to know as always, it is a blessing. A lot of times people, you know, they begin to think, they see the programs on television and they think, well, you know, everything is great and it is to God be the glory. But I want you to know we depend upon people just like you to stand with us. So thank you for that. We'll get into the word as soon as Shantae shares this special message with you. So please listen as she comes your way right now. Hello, I'm Shantae Hawkman. In Exodus 12, we learn about the Passover and how God delivered the children of Israel from Egypt. God spoke to Moses and Aaron that for every house to take a lamb, a spotless lamb without blemish, and to sacrifice it and to take the blood upon the doorpost of each house. This blood would represent a token or a covering that the children will be protected from the plague of destruction. And God is this lamb. He represents this lamb from this passage. And we know that Jesus Christ has come as the sacrificial lamb for you and me, that he loved us so much that he gave his life for us and that he wants us to welcome him into our lives and as we allow God to, to come into our lives, that that blood is a covering over our hearts and over our lives, and that it protects us from eternal destruction, that as we ask Jesus to be our Lord, that the blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, is a covering over us, that we can have eternal life through Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that Jesus was without spot or blemish, and that he came with, and he knew no sin, but he came to die for you and me to take our sins. And as we confess our sins, God is faithful and he is just to forgive us from all of our sins and all of our unrighteousness. If you have never asked Jesus to be your Lord, I would love to invite you to pray with me today. And if you are living in sin and not serving God right now, I would love for you to pray with me. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And Father, I just ask you to come into my heart today to be my Lord and to be my Savior. Father, thank you that you sent your only son, Jesus, as a sacrificial lamb, the ultimate sacrifice, that I could be free from my sin. I ask you to come into my life today to be my Lord and to be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord. Thank you for praying this prayer with me. We would love to hear from you. We have a packet on salvation that we would love to send to you. So please call or write to us. And we want to hear from you and hear what God is doing for you. May God bless you and we love you. Well, praise the Lord. Notice, because... He lives. As the old song goes, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. You see, Jesus, he did. He died a horrible death. And we've been talking about that on our broadcast. But I want you to know that our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, did not stay in the grave. But after three days and three nights, he was raised from the dead victoriously. And he lives today. Praise the Lord for that. But with those thoughts in mind, we were teaching with you last time on Psalms 22, powerful chapter, and we saw that it was written in about 1044 before Jesus Christ came into the earth. 
you're thinking, now, wait a minute, this chapter is talking all about the events, many events that Jesus went through and some of the things he said. And yes, that's true. How could that be so when it was 1,044 years before? Well, it's so because this was the leading of the Holy Spirit. Our God knows the past, the God uh, that knows the present, and he knows the future. And he begins to declare these truths to David, and David begins to write them down. So we see the words that are verbatim that's used 1,044 years later with the things that transpired in Jesus' death. This last time we saw in verse 1 when David had penned, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring or my groaning or my travail or my pain. These were the words that Jesus cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But yet here we see David writing it. There was another passage that I wanted us to look, and, and we're not going to read the whole chapter, but in verse 6 through 8, the word says, But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. Remember that? He was despised and rejected of the people. All that that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying... He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him. As seeing he delighted in him. Now what are they, what's going on here? Well, this is saying what's going to happen. And we see this happen exactly when Jesus was hanging on the cross. You remember what they did? They mocked him. You saved others. Save yourself. Come down off the cross and save yourself. Here again, David is writing down what's going to happen with Jesus' crucifixion. It's interesting as I looked at this and it said that I am, but I am a worm and, and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. I'm a worm. It's interesting because when you look at the grub worm, this was, would have been known back in that day, these worms were crushed and this came from them, it was like a red liquid. They would take this red liquid and they would put materials in it to dye it red. So when we think of Jesus, he was crushed. Like a worm, he was crushed. And the very blood, that red blood flowed from his body. But now those who believe upon him, they are emerged, if you will, in the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. And their sins are removed. And just as the red dye would make a garment beautiful to be worn with much pride, we allow the blood of Jesus to be applied to us and our sins are removed away that I don't have to hang my head in shame and neither to you do you. We lift our heads not in a wrong kind of pride, but being pride, having the pride of knowing my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. His blood has washed me and cleansed me from all unrighteousness. I do not have to hang my head because of my sins of the past. I'm sorry about the sins that I've committed. There are things that I've done I wished I had not. But the blood of Jesus, yes, when he was crushed like the worms of that day, and that blood that came forth, that blood is still fresh today and it washes us and cleanses us. And we put on the garment of salvation, which is beautiful. We are cleansed and made holy by the finished work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then verse 11. Verse 11 says, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Now, we know that, and we're going to look at this later, but there was a, a cup that Jesus referenced when he looked into the cup. And he said, if it be possible, let this cup 
pass from me. What, what was that talking about? It was something that the Lord needed to drink from, not a natural cup like I have here with liquid in it, but it means experiencing or taking up on himself something that was required of him. That cup would be the suffering, the shame, the separation from the Father, being ushered into the lowest parts of the earth. And Jesus knew how horrible it was going to be, even so horrible that even in those moments when he knew what life was before him, his sweat became his great drops of blood. So Jesus talks about this. You're so far from me. There's none to help me. And in verse 12, many bulls have come past me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. What's he talking about, bulls? Well, in that day, Bashan was a city. And in this area, the ground was very fertile. And so the grasses, would grow, they would grow thick and beautiful. And the herds that they had of the bulls, they would eat of the grass and they became strong and they were healthy. And they could be very vicious as well. So the reference here is not being made to natural bulls, but it's being made to the demonic spirits that came to torment Jesus. You see, there were people mocking Jesus while he was on the cross, but I want you to know that it was more than just seeing the horrible nails in his hands and his feet. It was more than the scourging that he took upon his back. It was more than the crown that was of thorns that was placed upon his head. It was more of his flesh being torn as they lifted the cross to the air. It was more than that. But there was the spiritual realm where the demonic spirits was coming against his mind, against him in every way. And even what happened while Jesus was in the darkness, in the pit, if you will, for three days and three nights. It was horrific. So here the Holy, Spirit's, the Holy Spirit is referencing what's going to happen to Jesus Christ over here in the New Testament. So he is saying these demonic spirits, they're going to beset Jesus round about. They're going to torment him and they're strong demonic spirits. The scripture says they gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. In other words, Jesus was mortally wounded by what the enemy was doing here. He says, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. Wow, I can't even imagine. Literally, Jesus' heart, not only from the physical pain that he's experiencing, but the very ones that he had come and healed some of them and ministered to them, had the provision of the food when he multiplied the, the fish and the bread. But now there are those that are mocking him, making fun, and, and if you will, looking at him as he's hanging on the cross while he's naked and suffering like they are. Notice it said that I am poured out like water and my bones are out of joint. Can you imagine? It is said to those who have studied crucifixions that literally every joint comes out of place. Have you ever had a joint to come out of place? Jesus had all of his joints. It was out of place. And he looked, notice what he said. And my tongue, it cleaveth to my jaws. That's in verse 15. He says here again, it is melted in the midst of my bowels. Talking about his heart. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. Now, I don't know if you know what a potsherd is, but it's a broken piece of a vessel. They would have it made out of the earth. You know, they would mold it and make it to some kind of vessel. And if you had a broken piece from that, this is comparing Jesus to how dry that pot is. It's broken. There, it is completely dried out, if you will. And he says, And my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have come past me, the assembly of the wicked having closed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Now, I want you to notice this again. This was written 
1,044 years before Jesus Christ. And it is explained so vividly. Notice again, the dogs have come past me, and now there are those who have pierced my hands and my feet. Now he's making reference to the Gentiles. Even though we know that it was the high priest, the religious people that wanted it done, it was the Gentiles who actually put the nails in his hands and his feet. Okay, verse 17. He says, I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. That's exactly what happened. You see, they stripped Jesus of his clothing. And I would sure that some of the women had made him an, a very expensive uh, piece of clothing. It was all one piece. It was made in such a way there was no seam in it. My clothing today has seams in it. The material is pulled together, but somehow in the making of the fabric, they were able to make this fabric in a way there was no seam in it. It was a very expensive piece of clothing to the point that the soldiers that took it from Jesus did not want to tear it and divide it among them. They literally cast lots for it. We might take die today and throw them and see who wins, okay? This is what they did because one, they wanted to have this piece of clothing. They all wanted it, but they didn't want to tear it. So here we have a prophetic word of what's going to even happen to the clothing that was upon Jesus Christ. Verse 19, But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength, Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. That's the crying out of our Lord, even though he did not do that part from the cross, because if he had, a, we know that he could have been set free at any given moment. And then when we look at Matthew and 26, hope you have your Bibles and you're turning with me today. But in Matthew and chapter 26, we begin to see these things begin to happen. And we look down at verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane and said unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. I had the privilege of going to Gethsemane many years ago. And uh, I could literally feel the weight, the heaviness that was in that place. I was standing, they have a building erected there, and I was standing on the porch, and it was so heavy upon me that I, I felt the need to pull away and start coming against darkness that was coming up on me in those moments. It was so real and so vivid. And I, I knew that I was experiencing or being touched with, if you, can, if you, if you will, the, the truths concerning what Jesus went through in these moments. But here he is, he is with his disciples, and Jesus is going to go a piece from them to pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Notice, he's feeling the depression and the oppression coming upon him, just like I did that day I visited there. Then saith he unto them, listen carefully, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry you here and watch with me. I want you to notice that Jesus is, is right then. He is taken upon himself. All depression, all oppression, all anxiety, fear and worry. Listen, of all mankind. Have you ever felt heavy in your heart? Have you ever felt depression come upon you? I have. And it was horrible. But yet Jesus had already redeemed me from that. That has no right to me. Why? Because I'm a child of God. Depression has no right over you if you are born again today. You've been redeemed from that. Jesus has taken all that upon him. Sometimes we don't think about this being part of our redemption. We do hear a lot about the stripes that was put upon Jesus' back for our healing. We do talk a lot about the crucifixion. Oh, my daddy could preach the crucifixion in such a way that I would sit there and weep while he talked about it. 
And I would literally feel that I was at the foot of the cross and looking up at Jesus, and I'd feel the tears flow down my face, even from a little girl. And that's very real. But this was very real. Notice, it said that he was exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Notice that. Very, very powerful. Death would have been easier. This is the reason we see a lot of people that do not know about their redemption. They'll take their own lives because they're so depressed. They're so overwhelmed with life. The demonic spirits come, if you will, to gape upon them with the darkness and the heaviness, and they cannot stand it. They don't want to live with that, so many take their lives. When if they knew their authority over the demonic spirits and they could resist that devil. How? How do you do that, Charlotte, as a child of God? It's the authority of the Holy Spirit within us that we can say, you foul demon of oppression or fear, worry, anxiety, go from me. You have no right to me. My Jesus has redeemed me from that and I refuse you to put that upon me in Jesus' name. And I want you to know that James 4, 7, as we are submitted to God, we resist the devil and he will flee from us and he will take his oppression with him. I've seen it many times in my own personal life. But the Lord said, I'm exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. It's amazing that he was able to even survive in the Garden of Gethsemane because of the oppression. And then when you begin to see the same story, Luke 22, 43 and 44, you will see that his sweat, it began to change and it was blood that was trickling down his face. Why? Because of the oppression and the depression that was coming up on him, that death would have been easier than what he was experiencing. The Bible even says that it was so horrible there in the Garden of Gethsemane that the angels came and ministered to him. It might have been that if he had not had the angels, that death could have been the imminent. But they came and they ministered to him. I want you to know that we have been redeemed from oppression and depression. I do counseling in my church. I've been trained to be a counselor. I know how to counsel. But I know that if counseling is not done through the power of Jesus Christ and His name, there is not much that can be done for men, women, boys, and girls. It's because He lives that we can face our tomorrow. It's because of what Jesus has already done that He took upon Himself all of the darkness, all of the trouble, all of the problems. Why? Because He so loved you. Because He so loved me that he has a way of escape from what the enemy intends against you and against me. He has given us his word, which is truth. And knowing the truth can make us free. But many are bound by what the enemy is doing because they do not know truth. I'm preaching truth to you. Freedom belongs to you if you're a child of God. Oh, I wish I could have known this as a young girl, but I did not. But I know it now. So I want to encourage you to lay hold of what Jesus has already done for you. Right now, I break all oppression and depression off of you in the name that's above every name, Jesus. And I call you free. For whom the Son is set free is free indeed. Receive that today for your life. I've enjoyed ministering God's holy word to you. I trust it's in your heart, and you will walk it out in victory. We're going to be here next time. Be with us, and I love you. I love you all. Hello, I am Shantae Hawkman. Do you know how much Jesus loves you? We hear the song of Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And little ones to him belong, and they are weak, but he is strong. But the truth of that is so simple that God loves you so much. Sometimes we try to search for that love, that true love in our life, or things to fill that void or emptiness in our hearts. Sometimes uh, people in the world will go towards drugs or alcohol, or even just trying to succeed at one thing and then the other. And just the busyness of our lives, sometimes we forget about the love that God has for us, and that how much He wants us just to stop in the day 
and spend that special time with him in prayer and in worship. For we know the Bible in John 3, 16 says, For God so loves the world that he gave his only son Jesus, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. In verse 17, it says, For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus didn't come to condemn us or to make us feel less than. And sometimes we feel like we're not even worthy enough to come before him. But God wants us to come to him, to come boldly. It says in Hebrews in chapter 4 and verse 15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time or need. This verse says that Jesus, he was touched with the feelings of our infirmities, our weaknesses, the things that we face every day, that God, he knows our heart and he knows where you are today. And I just wanna come and just encourage you that whatever you are facing, if there is an addiction in your life, God can set you free from it. There is nothing impossible through Jesus Christ. And he wants you to come into him and to call upon him. Romans 8, 13 says, call upon the Lord and you will be saved. God wants you just to come to him and come boldly to the, his throne and find that grace and that help in the time of your need. Whatever it is, I want to pray a prayer with you today and that God can deliver you and just minister his healing touch to you. Father, I come to you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And I just lift up every person today, Lord, that is listening. And Father, I thank you for ministering to their need today. That God, you see them there and you know their need. And God, we know that nothing is impossible with you. And as we call upon your name, Jesus, that you are there, that you never leave us and you never forsake us, and that you were always there to, to comfort us and to strengthen us. And Father, I ask you to meet that need today in every life. And God, I thank you for it. And I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, Jesus. I know the Lord has touched you today, but please write to us or call us and let us know what God is doing for you. We have several packets on, on healing and, and uh, believing God and, and for salvation and deliverance. And there's many things that my mom has taught. And if there's a teaching that you need, please feel free to call and request that CD. But we just will continue to pray that God will minister to you and your needs today. And we love you and we, and we just bless you today.